What's good, my gamers and bowlers? Your man Vince Chang, aka the Energy, and we are at episode 16 of Shots Fired. How y'all feeling? Powered by Fever and also supported by Jelly Smack. What's going on, my people? It's been crazy in the NBA, as you already know. Jimmy Buckets is here. Jamal Bubble Murray is gonna be balling. The Joker has nothing for him to talk about, and I can't wait to see what Bam Bam's gonna do to the big man. All stuff right here on Shots Fired. If you're in the chat, let me know where you're watching from and get you a shout out. As I got my people there on TikTok. What's up, Derek Alberto? Appreciate you coming through. Yo, pageant, I feel you as well. My people on YouTube will be with you just shortly because I see some people were watching 3x3 today and that was insane. Shout out to all the teams. The World Cup is happening right now. And man, oh man, Austria is hosting the living daylights out of that tournament. I wish I was there. Shout out to my man, Kyle Montgomery, and also Baza doing the dang thing hosting. But next time, next time I'll be there. I'll be there for sure. All right, let's see my people there. Hey, what's going on, Mr. Harris? I feel you. You're in the room on YouTube. And what's up, the one and only, my brother. What's up, Kapazar? Zaire Carrington is in the house. Had a dope interview a couple of moments ago. I mean, that show was sick. He was able to talk about his amazing new 3xc program called drive 3x3 i've been wearing that shirt all day bro it really feels good on my skin like it's really smooth but check out drive 3x3 they actually got another tournament happening in sin city vegas and i can't wait oh we'll be a part of it we'll see but that's gonna be a dope tournament as well and i'm thinking something about kelsey club i don't know but she may be that we'll see. anyway what's going on three ivan what's good how you feeling brother thank you for coming through here and shots fired and if you don't know what shots fired is it's a show that's powered by fever in which we try to give you the best basketball content all around on three different platforms when it comes to twitch bomb TikTok, uh, and also youtube and then we just have fun we got some dope guests today i'm so excited to have gary ford's former NBA player, played on the Nuggets and played also overseas in so many different countries, played against Kobe. I'm going to dissect him because he also has this amazing comic series called The Soul Survivors that basically highlights, quote unquote, people with chronic illnesses, but gives them superpowers. So basically, they're just powerful than us. I, I, I don't want to give too much away. We'll get into that. Also, the FIBA story is going to be sick, and I can't wait to be doing that as well. All right, let's see. Sin City is here. All right. No, but without further ado, let's get the show started. And if you know about Shots Fired, we always start off with Talent Overload. And we're going all over the internet with this one. So this is Talent Overload on Shots Fired. Let's go! All right, we're going to go a little bit different this show, all right? So we've been highlighting multiple people from all around the world, all right? Finding people who are just basically in the backwoods, also dudes that have been doing it for a long time. I think the last person did was Professor. Shout out to Grayson Boucher. But now, let's get a little more broad because there's a couple of amazing social media pages that highlight kids and women all around the world. But the thing is, we never know their names, but what they do on the court is sick. Let's check it out right now because I'm actually really excited to watch this. So my producer gave me this and whoo, shout out to the king of the underdogs. It is a dope Instagram. You got to check it out. Mostly Asian ballers and then shout out to the Fun Bros with part of Asian Allergy and Sire Mouse NYC. Really good comedy show. And we actually had Andrew Yang, former president-elect, to actually perform with the sick. Oh, left him and twirled. Man, that's what you call a smoothie blender. How you add some extra sauce on that? I don't know how these dudes do it, but they do it. But anyway, King of the Underdogs has these amazing players that just been balling at courts. And luckily, someone has a camera and posts it. I mean, Take the shot, going to dunk. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, what's up, Euro team? I appreciate you coming through. Thank you. But anyway, oh, this was the most disrespectful thing in the world. I wish we could replay it because the dude crossed the dunk on him and then that little bit of salsa on him. Oh, it was so beautiful. I mean, we all remember, you know, Tyrone Lou back in 2001 when Alan Ivers jumped over it. That was a little bit different. That was sick. But look at his footwork. Footwork, 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 footwork. Hey, what's his? Bam. That's right there. It's called a Street Fighter Mortal Kombat finish him move. Ow! Rejected harder when I slid in Rihanna's DM. She never got me back. I don't think she thinks I exist, so it doesn't matter. But, oh, man. Ow! Oh, how do you wedgie a block? You, how you give a, 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 a air wedgie to a man? You don't do that to grown men. But look at this right here. Oh! I mean, even my producer said, mm. Like, yo, my engineer in France just went, mm. Ow! 
Yo, these are crazy. Also, shout out um, to X, um, Expo Recruits, another amazing page that find these crazy plays from all over social media and all over the world. Because if you just love basketball and you just get stuck in the black hole of Instagram, you got to check these pages out. But man, oh man, look. Oh, okay, now they're getting too physical. Oh, oh now they tripping. Oh, come on, man, it's basketball. It ain't Muay Thai. But look at this beautiful reverse layup windmill. Who in his bag? Nice fady. Now look at this defense. That's terrible. And look at the cross, boss, puppet, spin, step back. I'm sorry. Bye bye. Now that's how you take a full court press to the next level and then just throw it. Oh, damn. Okay, so here's the thing. You're not supposed to shake the hand of the per Oh, his ankles like just left him like he was supposed to be back to deported. That oh, that's that. He ripped him. Oh my. Some of these I'm watching for the first time. That was sick. Oh, reverse dunk on your mans with everyone watching. You better hope your girlfriend didn't see that because she's going to dunk you. Oh, see, that's too much. Boop, boop, boop. Okay, we don't condone fighting, but they got a two-piece right there. So that's a technical back in the day, like in the 70s and 80s. The technical now is like you throw the basketball. That's deep. Man, who are these kids? Who are these animals? But look at this. This is disrespectful. Doink, doink. Bop, bop. Up there. He... Did he glide into a Euro step? I've never seen, how do you glide into a Euro step? Yo, this is a shout out some talented ballers from all over the world. And also you can come to this page and you can find pages yourself. And most of us are ballers, extravagant. I think we just like the game. So at the end of the day, check out those two pages, the King of Underdogs and also Expo Recruits. They got a lot of kids that you've probably never even seen before that just got talent. And I love basketball, so I watch it all day. I always try to find them to give them a shout out, but most of them don't tag them. I don't know why, but it's nice to know that this ball is out there and there's a whole bunch of content that you can watch. Oh, shout out my people on TikTok. Thank you so much for coming through. Yep, but Sin City, ah, uh, yeah, cap him. Sin City is going to be dope. And also I got with my man, who's got a good morning, Rupert Ponds TV. How you doing? How you feeling? How you liking the show? Just getting my people on YouTube ready. All right, let me check some other stuff going on right now because we have a great guest that's coming through in a little bit. I can't wait to get him. But anyway. This next segment, though, is all breaking news. And we already know what we're talking about because the breaking news is kind of obvious. The heat brought the heat. But anyway, this is breaking news and shots fired. Let's go. All right. Y'all been watching the finals. Now, everybody thought LeBron was going to do the unthinkable. Everybody thought, you know, the one and only Steph Curry was going to come back. But now we got two unexpected teams going to the NBA Finals, but if you're a baller, it's not that much of a surprise. Let's check it out right now, all right? Break it down, because this was an incredible conference finals. I mean, the Heat seemed to run away with it with a 3-0 leading, but Jason Tatum finally woke up, and Derek White with that putback after Marcus Smart missed that. That's how you call an offensive rebound to a game winner. But at the end of the day, the Heat responded in style on hostile ground, 103 to 84, and because that man right there, Jimmy Buckets, and they'll be facing this guy, the Joker, in the Nuggets. And it's all over Boston. It's all over. Bye. Okay. Which has not become the first team in NBA history to win in seven games. I mean, you had to go through it. I mean, it is insane. But this man right here, and this man right here, and that man right there, Al Harford was basically a five-time NBA All-Star, by the way. I mean, the veteran to, you know, Mr. Tatum and also Brown. This man's teaching some things. They just could not overcome Jimmy Buckets. And that beautiful cast with Kevin Love. And if Tyler Hero was there, woo, it would be different. But as you see, it could just be from certain things. Maybe the stakes of Game 7 also simply could be, it's like a incredible amount of pressure. But they could be exhausted from the incredible Ramon Tata. Ramon Tata, I think that is. But also Celtics shot like 39%. But back in the day, just three years ago, after they're running the finals in the bubble, Orlando, you know, in the, the Lakers of Miami, you know, the... Club returned to the finals, which is dope. I mean, after losing to LeBron and Lakers, that's got to hurt. But I'm telling you, depriving from their opponents and of their place of prosperity, the Heat also secured their own, and now they're going to the final dance. Now, the thing about this is that they become the second team in NBA history to reach the finals as an eight seed after the Knicks did it in 1999. And as you can see, the Nuggets is going to be ready. The Nuggets have dominated the Western Conference in regular season and in the first three rounds of the playoffs. And then the one thing I got to know is that we have to love and love the people who made Miami Heat, Miami Heat. As you can see, 
giving homage to the players, to Kevin Love and also Jimmy Butler, is the one and only co-owner of Utah Jazz and three times NBA champions, MVP 2006, Dwayne Wade. I'm telling you, this guy looks like an elder uncle, makes you proud of all his young ones. And this man right here, Jimmy Butler, is exceptional, especially what he's doing with his game. I mean, this season has been insane for him, and he's just getting better and better. In the event of a title, there would clearly be a strong case that would be made in being considered one of the most beautiful titles ever in terms of both root and context. And you see right now, Kevin Love was a huge part. I mean, he belongs in the league. But the thing about that, he's uh, got a little salt and pepper. He's a little older. But he had to leave you know, during game three to a leg injury. But he's still rocking out and doing his thing. And I know this guy right here, Miami Heat president and former coach Pat Riley. And that's from 1995 to 2003, and also 2005 to 2008, was coaching the Heat is extremely happy. I mean, this man is a nine time NBA champion across his years and his tenure being the NBA. But to see another one come through, it's going to be insane. I can't wait for it. And that's why I want to see this. Miami Heat, I got to admit, I think it's going to be a strong NBA final. Nike says these finals are going to be weak. Nuggets are so much better than the Heat, no chance. All right, Nike, how about this? You know the game's going to happen. Tune in next week, and let's see how true this is. Because we have already seen that some of these teams have been overlooked. Everyone thought the Lakers were going to go. Everyone thought Golden State were so good. And look where we are right now. Look where we are right now, bro. I don't know what's going to happen, but I think playoff Jimmy going to step it up. I think Bam's going to step it up. I, man, if Kevin Love is good enough, he going to step it up. And Kyle Lowry is still one of the most effective point guards in the game. Now, yes. We know the Nuggets have a deep bench, and they got a strong trio, okay? Aaron Gordon, yes. Nikola Jokic, yes. Jamal Murray. But I think it's just going to make the game even better. Something's going to step up. This is going to be like Dragon Ball Z and the Super Saiyan in the sense of they're just going to get stronger every game. I don't think it's going to be a sweep. Personally, I think something's going to wake in the heat and just show everybody that they can ball. Now, I want them to win. Am I saying the Heat are going to win the NBA Finals? No, I want them to, but I am saying they are going to make it competitive. As we just said, I don't see any solution for Jochik and Murray. Now, here's the thing. I hear your opinion, and this is about shots fired. This is when you come back and forth, and this is what we talk about. That is true. But the thing is, if Bam under bio is able just to break down and show a little defense, all he needs to do is better than Anthony Davis. Anthony Davis was too slow as a defender. Bam has more speed and versatile. So I think he can disrupt Georgia more than Anthony Davis did. That's my opinion. Jimmy, uh, maybe have MJ's blood in his veins. Man, AG Benji, I know Jimmy has MJ blood in his veins. No, we all know that rumor is true. I'm sorry. It's a rumor. I'm, I, I wasn't true. But I think it's true because at the end of the day, this man, the, 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 the rumor, same city where Jimmy's born. Mother says, I can't tell you who your father is because it'll, it'll disrupt his legacy or his fame. And also, if you look at the tendencies, he's literally Michael Jordan 2.0 as if he was in this day and age. Remember how the one and only Michael Jordan said, hey, when it's 0-0 zero, zero, or you're up, it's easy to talk smack. But when you're down and then it's an equal score, that's a testament, man. Jimmy does that all day. There's something, there's something. Like, I really want to go to, a, like, an event, find Jordan, you know, and just steal his cup. And then go to an event with Jimmy and steal his cup. Go to the lab. Mm, 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 and just find out who is the father of Jimmy Butler. If anyone can find that, you have millions of dollars in your hand. If you can prove it, though. Yeah, don't fake it. But, yeah, I still think there is some Michael Jordan vein in Jimmy Butler. That's true. But, yeah, back to you, Nike. I'm just saying it's going to be a good series. It's going to be a good series. I agree with that. Yo, what's up, Diego? How you doing? All right. Now, my man Zaire Carrington already teased us with something with our guest. And our guest is amazing. There's a lot of things about him I want to get into. I don't want to give so much away. But right here in Shots Fired, this is the guest interview. So let's check it out. All right, so this man right here is a former NBA player. He's also played in probably over four to five different countries around the world. He's also one of the few NBA players to have a chronic illness and push through it and still be successful. And it became such an apparent cornerstone in his life that he made this fantastic comic book series called The Soul Survivors that actually elevates it to another way, taking different kids from different planets and they have superpowers with also chronic illnesses, illnesses to actually increase their self-esteem. 
All I know is that I can't wait to have this guy on the show. I'm going to ask some questions. It's all about him. And this right here is the one and only Gary Forbes. Let's check out this highlight video. Gary Orlando Forbes. Yes, I'm putting your full government out there because you look like an Orlando. How you doing, brother? What's going on? What's going on, man? That's some y'all. Y'all had the old clips, man. That was the the, the late clips of me, but. So. <laughs> It look good though, man. I gotta admit, you look, look fit. Good. You look like you're ready to ball. And the one thing I do know is that I can't do the stuff that you do because you you all about that life because you travel around the world and stuff. But before we dive into it, the first question I ask everyone on the show is that what is the first memory that you can recall that involved basketball in your life? Um, my father built us a basketball hoop uh, from scratch. Uh, my father was a Panama welder. I mean, it was a welder in the Panama Canal. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he built us a hoop just straight of, you know, backboard, um, you know, regular wood and, and iron. And, you know, I just remember playing every day in the, in the living room, you know, with my brothers and, you know, I had to cry and beg when I moved to Brooklyn, New York for my father to send, you know, my hoop over. <laughs> you know, that I, now at four years old, going into, you know, moving to a new city, Brooklyn, New York, you know, I just wanted something to, you know, make me, you know, feel like I was back home and something mm -hmm. to connect with people. And, oh, um, my God. Thank you for that. I mean, you're from Panama. I mean, look at the good hair. I'm telling you, I don't think you just, you can go in the pool, come out, just be like Kanye and stuff like that. You look like you should be part of a head and shoulders commercial. That's how good <laughs> your hair is. All right. But, but Panama is incredible because you were playing in 2007, 2011. In 2017, you're at the America Cup. What was it like playing on an international scale, more Southern, like an island kind of vibe versus like the big cities that you went to? Oh, man. I mean, representing my country was was a very um proud moment and a big thing and you know just playing against you know european basketball and 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 you know latin basketball players who have you know done great things and you know it was really really competitive and it was a, a great part of my career and i was you know glad to be able to represent my country and um you know do great things I mean, Panama is a beautiful country. I mean, I know you got that flag. You got that, you know, blood in your veins. I mean, I'm Jamaican Chinese, so I got like Caribbean. I'm I'm around you. Like, I'm not that good at geography, but I know I'm like somewhere near you that we can say what's up. But hey, I'm Jamaican, Beijing, all that stuff in my family too. Oh, you got Beijing too? Oh yeah, yeah. my what? All right, be yeah. backing out down there. All right, cool. So you know exactly what crop over is and all that. Yeah, 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 for sure. For sure. I gotta go. Now I saw that you also went to University of Virginia, but then transferred to the University of Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. Why was that? Because University of Virginia, that's a high level. Massachusetts just a little bit lower. What was it for playing time or was it coaching? What was going on? Um, there was a there was a lot of different uh, factors. Um, you know, obviously one of my uh, the coach at the time he had got fired um, mm -hmm. coming in, and you know I was just feeling just. I needed a, a fresh new start and, you know, I could have went to, uh, you know, bigger schools. I could have, you know, had tr transfer offers from USC, Memphis. Yep. And, you know, one of my AAU coaches told me, you know, to go and be a big fish in a small pond rather than a oh. small fish. So, you know, I took that, took that advice and it was, I believe that it was probably the best decision of my life because even now to this day, me and my teammates from UMass, we still have a group chat, we mm. talk week and, you know, we really created that brotherhood. So um, great times at UMass, um, you know, wouldn't change that decision for anything. Man, that's the thing. I love when, uh, you know, the interviews can transition to my next question, because as you said, you want to be a, a big fish in a small pond. You were dope in high school. Like, literally, you were city player of the year, all city, McDonald's All-American finalist, grabbed 766 rebounds in your high school career, and also 1,500 points. Like, bro, 
you are a problem, but then you're also doing this in Brooklyn. And I don't think these kids understand. Walk them through the different competition you got to go through between going to some rinky dink, whatever place in Mississippi, but then balling in Brooklyn, where like it's like the Mecca of basketball. Yeah, Brooklyn, Brooklyn was <laughs> Brooklyn was different, man. And <laughs> what's crazy is I even played my sophomore year of high school, so I could have had like over two thousand points. Really. Oh, he just gonna sprinkle that in like salt. Just go a mm-hmm, little bit of extra season on the just mm-hmm, he got two thousand. Okay. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, man. You know, just playing against the likes of like Gary Irvin, Quincy Doobie, um, Sebastian Telfair, and you know the list of the names go on. It mm-hmm. was just to you know to be considered one of the top players in the country, let alone in, you know, in Brooklyn, New York was, you know, a real big thing for me. And, um, you know, I'm glad I'm one of the players that, you know, that made it to the NBA that I can have that on my, uh, you know, my, you know, <laughs> on resume. My, yeah, resume. <laughs> um, you know, it feels, it feels good. It's kind of like just a, a, a proud moment, obviously being from Panama as well as being from Brooklyn, you know, I carry that really, you know, on my sleeve and, um, you know, I wear that. Yeah. Proudly. You should wear it proudly. And before we transition between your professional career, you're diagnosed, and I'm just going to say it, with type 1 diabetes. Mm-hmm. Now, when did you find that out? Was it in high school, college, or when you were born? Um, I was 19 after my freshman year of college. Had a pretty mm-hmm. good had a pretty good season. Um, you know, in the beginning of the year, I started off great. Um, you know, towards the end of the year, you know, not so much. Um, just hitting, I guess, that freshman wall, I guess. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, I was I went home during the summer, and I just remember I was like maybe like two twenty four at the time, two hundred twenty four uh-huh. pounds. And by the end of the week that I was home, I was back down to like one ninety eight. I came into college at one eighty five, um, so I was just you know I had the the typical symptoms, you know, constant urination, constant thirst, constant hunger. And you know, I just couldn't figure out what it was. I actually kind of thought it was like a urinary tract infection. Like, <laughs> the bathroom, I was just like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah, urinary tract infection, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but, you know, and I think it was just, even just my ignorance of not knowing, you know, symptoms. Obviously I grew up with my father and, you know, we never really talked about diabetes, which I kind of, I am happy in a sense because he didn't make it seem like it was such a negative or a bad thing, which kind of, you know, helped me look at being able to manage type 1 diabetes and do everything that I'm doing, even though it's a, a 24-7 chronic health condition that, you know, is very serious. It is very sad. That's like the you're, you're, you're unable to produce insulin. That's you have to give yeah. yourself shots, and that's exactly. what happens with sugar. And that's you can't have a chocolate chip cookie, and then you're like, ah, yeah. sugar, <clears throat> and then you go down. <laughs> but the thing about that is that so you you found this out in college, yeah, freshman and, year, and then you make it to the NBA. Now. It's already known, they said, to get to the NBA is like winning the lottery, okay? When you're going to that draft, only like 60 players a year get a chance, you know, to, to show their stuff on that level. And you're doing this with this boulder on your shoulder. What were the workouts like after finding out you have diabetes, going to college, and then getting to the NBA? What was that transition when it comes to that beating on your body? You know what? It was, it honestly gave me... Uh, you know, boost of confidence. Uh, mm. It was like a big self-esteem boost that I have type one diabetes. It's a scary thing. All these people around here making it seem like it's the end of the world. You know, I even remember my doctor when he closed the blinds and was like, "Yo, you may have to, you know, chill out with basketball and take, you know, school and your health more serious." And I was just like, "Yeah, I don't hear nothing you're saying." <laughs> I'm still, I'm still get into the NBA with, you know, type one diabetes, and um, I. I Obviously, in my own ego, I do feel I should have been drafted. I was a player of the year, killed every, you know, pre-draft workout. I was, you know, MVP of Portsmouth, MVP of Orlando pre-draft camp. But the fact that I was hesitant or, um, you know, just hiding the fact that I had type 1 diabetes, I wasn't really outspoken about it because at the time of 2007, 2008, diabetes awareness wasn't, you know, as high or at a, at a peak as it is now. So, you know, I just wanted to remove that stigma and not have people look at me and, and have pity for me or, yeah. you know, 
you know, any kind of things like that. So I, was, I hid it from scouts and GMs, and I believe that that was one of the reasons why, or the main reason why I wasn't, um, you know, drafted because there's no way I shouldn't have been drafted in the 2008 draft. I was better than definitely <laughs> – 60 other players sure. oh 100 percent. you were because i again i've been watching your stats like when i look at my stuff i'm looking at like what you guys did in the past and numbers don't lie i love numbers but the thing is that this is when and this is gonna be sound where this is shots fired so i do shoot shots of people social media wasn't as big when you got into the league i wish it was because you would have been a story like imagine you going yo this player got tight one night like magic johnson became a story and he got something much worse than that right <laughs> Diabetes, and then you cook it because, yo, Sasha, pick up that first pick. You got to play one on one with Kobe Bryant. You, yeah. you know how much energy you need to have against Kobe Bryant, and you got to have an insulin pen in your sneaker just to make sure. What was it like <laughs> going against Black Mamba like that close? Uh, I mean, obviously, that's my, you know, one of my idols, you know, and to check in the game in the Staples Center and to see Jack Nicholson on the side and all these stars and, you know, my, you know, George Carl checks and he subs me into the game. He was like, yo, you got Kobe. And I'm just like, wow, I'm really here. <laughs> no, I, I had butterflies for a second. I was just like walking, standing next to him. I was like, yo, this is the guy that I've been watching on TV for, you know, for years. And, you know, but I just, you know, locked in and it was, you know, great, great experience just obviously playing in the NBA, but playing against, you know, some of my idols who, you know, guys who I looked up to and, and wanted to model my game after. Yeah, and now, again, everyone has a Kobe story. And then maybe you do. Do you have one that was on the court, af off the court? Because, you know, there's so many things about him picking up a check or the way he talks smack. It's completely different. Do you have one of those stories? Yeah, I, well, actually, when I got to the league, I wasn't – I mean, I was I was strong, but um, I was trying to – that, that I might, it might have been that same play where I'm trying <laughs> to get in – I was trying to front him in a post and <laughs> – Dude held me off with one arm, and he's like talking, like talking to me. He's like, uh, 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 -uh you're not getting that. <laughs> and I was just like, I'm thinking, like, how's this guy holding me off with one arm? And I was just like, I was like, yeah, I gotta get in the weight room. I, I started to get in the weight room the next uh, couple of weeks stronger, so I could, uh, you know, to uh, to compete with him. And uh, I think the next game in Denver, I think we, I think we either we beat them or blew them out, and I had a couple of blocks on, on Kobe, so I was ready you know, from that game to the next. So, um, you know, it was a big, big, big moment for me right there. Uh, bro, to block Kobe, to block, that that's like, yo. Bro, like, Emil Schumpert has that that story of like, he's like, hey, good game, good fella. He's like, yo, just right. like 12 minutes left. 12 minutes left. <laughs> and uh, it was crazy is when we, uh, I had one, a couple of my friends uh, from Brooklyn at the game, uh, a couple of games where we played in, in Denver and, you know, we were waiting for him after the game. I was trying to, you know, like either like talk to him or get a sneaker sign kind of thing. And I didn't realize that he travels with a like a different security detail than the team. So oh. we, we were waiting there for like two hours or like hour after the game. I was like, yeah, I don't think this guy's coming out, bro. <laughs> like, yeah, Kobe left to back somewhere and he's already at the airport. Whatever. I'm just like, oh, all right. I see how it goes. Oh, okay. Well, um, I'm gonna go back to my hotel and just right. find myself as a groupie. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a groupie for Kobe. I'll say that. Uh, but yeah, holding you off of one hand, I mean, he had a different kind of strength. But now I want to transition into this other, you know, endeavor that you have going on called the Soul Survivors. And we're going to bring it up right now because I went through every character, Dolly, Autumn, Brody, Gus, Dash, Coco, Laser, or is it Lazar, Awesome, Tank, Tula, Cody, and Lisa wow first of all and from three different planets neary deltas and kinesis yeah Bro, where did you come up with was this all you did you have right because i want you to explain it because i want to read this manga or comic because these are some real great characters yeah i mean all of this came from you know my imagination man i was i was always big into comic series and cartoons growing up um you know i just and you know, some of these are, some of these characters are like memories from my childhood, you know, favorite cartoons and, and comic books. Um, you know, Dolly and Dash are from the Thundercats, you know, that I used to watch back in the day. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so it's like you know, different things um, that, you know, resonated with my childhood and growing up. And, you know, I wanted to use not only my, I guess my health, um, you know, my health condition 
-hmm. and make you know more positive light to it bring light to it because you know being one of three players in the history of the nba to play with in the nba with diabetes is kind of like a big stat yeah. But, you know, there's there's millions of people who are out there that have diabetes that probably get told that, you know, they can't do something. So yeah. I remember when I was, I think it was in 2011 to 12, where I had my first, um, I had my first fundraiser, um, a softball event, mm -hmm. where a parent came up to me and she was like, yo, thank you for, you know, for being who you are. Thank you for doing everything you're doing. I'm just like, you know, I didn't really understand what she was talking about. And she was like, you know, my son was in the car with his father and, you know, he told him that he wanted to try out for a basketball team tomorrow. And, you know, the dad told him no, because you have type one diabetes and his friend, luckily his friend was in the car and he was like, Gary Forbes has type one diabetes and he plays in the NBA. So I was just like, what? you know, from that moment, I realized that, you know, my life or my story had a purpose and, um, you know, it was just, took time to figure it out from, you know, 2012 to, you know, when I started to, you know, curate and write the book and, and think of the different ideas. And, but I'm very, very, um, you know, just happy with the fact that this came from a thought in my mind to now I'm you know, <laughs> holding it in my hand. Yes. So, yeah, man. Um, you know, I, I really am happy about this. I know this is my purpose in life and I'm just happy about this journey. And it's just the beginning. This is volume one of many, many, many more to come. Um, yeah. It's like yeah. kind of like a basically a real life X-Men, mm -hmm. um, you know, and we're mutants. So, yeah. you know, it's kind of changing that and making it more real life um, mm -hmm. in a sense, because all of what's crazy is all of these health conditions we are all either connected to it indirectly or directly. I'm sure you know someone with diabetes or, yep. you know, or cancer or any one of these. So, you know, I just want to remove the stigma from all of these health conditions and, mm -hmm. you know, just change the narrative. And that's the thing is that's like when I leaked into these characters, I mean, you know, one has ADD, but then another one has, you know, a, dis a degenerative muscle disorder. Another one has this and you attack on all these illnesses that are chronic that kids may take a second that I can't do something like we had Manny Love from the Harlem Globetrotters the other day and he has a form of dwarfism and he would travel the world and people be appreciative like people say he, people can't do stuff because of whatever physical ability but you can always push past that and you prove that which is yeah. beautiful but to make it into a comic book so now children can understand that on a deeper level because like real quick what was your give me your top three cartoons that you watch all the time as a kid um you know it's crazy so i got kind of like the idea from um from uh what was it no not captain planet um yeah um yeah captain planet mm -hmm. uh, uh you know the earth wind water fire mm -hmm. was, um <laughs> x-men yep um, and conan and conan wow conan like yeah, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Conan, like yeah. when he met, yo. Yeah, back in the days, it was like the cartoon <laughs> version of it. Yeah. And so that was that was my that was that was my uh, my cartoons growing up. But um, yeah, man. Oh, and obviously Thundercats. That's Thundercats, like. yeah. You know, Thundercats is the uh, you know top four, top four. That's my Mount Rushmore <laughs> cartoons. <laughs> I got you because like mine was like rocket power growing up, like doing things like what they did. And and I would go to Toonami, Dragon Ball Z. I'm a huge anime mm -hmm. fan. So was that, but it was, I, I, I Dragon Ball Z era. Mm -hmm. I was too busy, um, you know, working out, playing ball every day, trying, trying to get to the league. <laughs> exactly. That's what we do. We watch Dragon Ball Z because this dude is doing push ups. He's like, I'm going to come a Super Saiyan one day. And I think that's why we screamed. I think every dude that played screamed thinking their hair was going to turn gold. Like that's what we thought. <laughs> And I'm Jamaican, so I always thought instead of like the spiky hair, I would grow locks. Like, and, <laughs> and be a Rasta Super Saiyan. Like, I want that. You know what I mean? I'm going to fight for this song. I'm going to save the planet. Like, right, I don't right. care. But I will say that I, I already purchased um, volume one on Amazon. So I appreciate right. for that. And you can get the whole thing and go to Amazon, get the link, and then you can get it from Linktree right there from the page from the Soul Survivors. But Two things I want to hit on as well is that you have this amazing career and you hit so many people when it comes to, you know, telling them you don't have to be limited by any ailment. 
but then you also travel the world. Like that's another thing. Like, you went from Panama to America, but then you went to Venezuela, China, and Israel. What was that like with type 1 diabetes, but then playing in these different countries, not really having family or someone, quote unquote, that you can lean on to when you had those bad days? Right. Um, I mean, some sometimes where it was tough, um, not even going to lie, especially, um, you know, just managing type 1 diabetes. Um, I had a very scary event in Argentina where I went into a diabetic coma um, later on in my career. Um, obviously, we know the foods overseas are, are cooked with a lot less, um, you know, chemicals and all of this yep, stuff that yep. <laughs> this was up here. But just managing that, um, you know, overseas was, was very different because obviously you're on your own. Like the team is like, yo, you know, we gave you your meds, you know, you do what you do and you, know, you just got to come practice and play ball. So, you know, versus where I'm in college, where I have you know trainers and doctors and staff that are, you know, basically take care of me and and even in the NBA, um, you know, the team doctors were great and were, you know, on top of everything that I had to do. Mm -hmm. And just being overseas, just being a new country and, you know, just dealing with all those different kind of uh, adversities, it was, it yeah. was challenging, but, you know, I'm always up for a challenge and, you know, those things, even what's crazy is even after, um, you know, I woke up from my diabetic coma, I was just like, yo, can I still play? Can I still practice? <laughs> Yeah, after I came out for almost dying, yo, can, <laughs> can, I, can I still get about 50 shots up, please? No? All right. Damn it. Yeah, yeah so. Like, all the things, uh, you know, I feel that, um, you know, it, it all comes, the optimistic mindset that I have comes from my father. You know, I, mm. like I said, I've been in a diabetic coma, a couple of low blood sugar episodes that was, you know, very scary, could have been, you know, near death, um, six knee surgeries. And, you know, if you know anything, if, you know, diabetics or someone with, uh, you know, type one diabetes, it's kind of hard for us to, you know, recover or heal as quick as somebody who doesn't. Um, yeah. So six, six knee surgeries was kind of tough. It kind of, um, you know, put a hold on my career. Maybe I would say maybe three to four years where I wasn't really active due to knee surgery. So yeah, that's actually, let's, let's add some more points on it that I yep. can add. <laughs> <laughs> So but, going through the knee surgery and also diabetes and shit. So you, I mean, and stuff. I mean, you can just ba 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 keep going. Right, right. I feel like Wolverine in the sense, man. Like, this. <laughs> this man recovers, comes back, and he's strong. Like you're Wolverine, Goku, and then yeah. also Captain Planet all at once. Like it's just right. everybody. Like, right. and that, and that's what I love about it. Now I do want to ask because you traveled. Is there a city or country Israel. that was? So, oh, okay. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Did, didn't even yeah, that's quick. They're quick straight to it. Straight to it. But, but, so Israel Israel, Israel, Israel. Israel Israel was one of the most beautiful places um you know I've been in my life and you know my family is very religious and just to see the you know that that land it was you know an amazing experience. Um the yeah. culture was amazing, people are wonderfully nice, the mm -hmm. weather is amazing like Miami, the food is great. And I have not one bad thing to say in my experience with um you know being and living in Israel. Um, China was China was cool too. Um, I lived in one of the, seven, I think maybe the sixth biggest city in all of China. Um, okay. Fans were great. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I lived next to, I was near Hong Kong. So I was, you know, pretty much there all the time and um, Shanghai as well. So those cities were uh, you know, great to see. And I think that me being so, I guess, culturally diverse <laughs> and traveling to all these places played a yeah. big part in, you know, the creation of the book in different mm -hmm. land and, you know, different places where people have come from. Cause, you know, I've just seen a lot of, a lot of things, you know, I've seen a lot of people in a lot of things. So I think, you know, the message of soul survivors is a global, uh, is mm -hmm. a global one. Yep. And that's, and that's why I want to ask you about that because from my travels, I've been blessed because of FIBA and stuff to travel to Egypt and go to mm -hmm. China and a kid from Brooklyn, again, Again, you were born in Panama, though. You were born in Panama. Mm -hmm. So you, you saw a culture, but then you, you get to the big city. And then we kind of get pigeonholed in this, like, all right, well, it's the greatest city in the world. We don't right. really need to see anything else. Right. And then when we do, it just opens up our mind to be like, yo, one, we're spoiled. We don't know what poverty really is. Right. Two, no. 
there's a lot more beauty out there than just going to a club and seeing a dime or going on top of the Empire State Building and seeing that beautiful skyline, right. but to see a, a natural river. So, and then that's why I look at your comic book because there had to be so much more creative inspiration mm -hmm. from your travels. Yeah. Now, would, would you ever move to Israel if you had another chance or you're like, oh, I'm good here? Um, yeah, I really, actually wouldn't mind that. But Israel is, I mean, they speak English there. I just had to, you know, learn my, uh, you know, my Israeli tongue. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, like it's, it's a definitely a easily livable, transferable place. I always tell kids, I always tell guys who are coming out of college, I'm like, man, yo, yeah, I gotta tell y'all agents, y'all first, y'all first job should be in Israel for you to be, cause it's, it's, a, you'll, be comfortable. <laughs> you'll be comfortable. That's um, what's man. up. Yeah. Oh man, like I said, and that's like I said, I'm just I'm just sprinkling to existence. I don't know if you have a family or anything like that, but maybe something happens with Soul Survivors and you gotta go to Israel. Maybe, maybe it's, it's gonna be global, man. It's gonna be global. It's gonna be global. <laughs> well, the one thing I do know is that my paper copy is coming this week. It's already in the docket. Uh, once I do it, I'm gonna definitely take a reading it. I'm gonna post it. And what you're doing to me hits home because half my family suffers from cancer. Like that's it just it just we just get cancer. Another mm -hmm. half has diabetes and high blood pressure. So it's right. like those things that I'm always fearful of myself. It's like, when, when am I going to get that call? And then how am I going to live my life after? You know what right. I mean? But you're a person that literally I can go to kids and go like, oh, you have that? Oh, you have a dream? Well, there's a guy that right. did it. No, And no, no, no. He didn't obtain his dream, then got it. He got it and then still got his dream. Mm -hmm. So impossible means nothing and like just thank you so much for your time and do you have any like outwards that you want to give to the people like a message that you have because this is right now your soapbox because this is this is your show well soul survivors is not just a comic series um mm -hmm. we are going to be um you know on tv very soon i'm manifesting that because everything that i've done i've manifested so um yeah. we're gonna be on tv soon movies <laughs> merchandise is out um <laughs> And the end goal for Soul Survivors, uh, besides a video game and toys and all those things, is a theme park for children with chronic health conditions. Um, you know, I know they have a Make-A-Wish Foundation, and that's for like one or two kids that, you know, get to go to Disney World. But we want to create a theme park for, you know, children with um, these chronic health conditions so they can feel, you know, home and safe. And, you know, I, I'm, I can't imagine what a parent, you know, <laughs> You know has to do with a you know with a child who's suffering from a chronic health condition and needs that kind of you know space or kind of motivation to feel happy so um you know that's all in my plans with soul survivors volume one is out now and yes. um, a quote that i always live by doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith oh doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith man don't don't man i'm light-skinned you can't drop the mic. <laughs> I say, I drop the mic. Yo, I'm going to get some merch. If you ever need a voiceover character in your series, I'm here. But sure. Gary, thank you so much for joining us. This has been a dope interview. We're going to get this snippet. Said, and all I'm going to ask you is do this. All you got to do is say your name and say this is Shots Fired, and then we can send you off. This is Gary Forbes, and you're here with Shots Fired. Oh, this man does it. Look, he ready for the Hollywood and all the face. Yeah. Yo, Mr. Forbes, we'll definitely keep in contact. Thank you again. I'll talk to you soon, brother. Appreciate you love, bro. Love, man. Yo, yo, yo. When I say you better get up with Soul Survivors now, do it now. S-O-L-E. Okay, that's the thing. Soul Survivors right now is all over social media when it comes to Instagram. And like I said, I just got my book. It's on Amazon. It's 20 bucks. It's a paperback. And it's a great series that can definitely highlight, you know, and empower kids to boost their self-esteem, even those who face certain health challenges. Gary Forbes is a pioneer when it comes to this and also is one of those people that proves impossible means nothing. Everything's impossible until you do it. And I love that quote. Doubt your doubts before you doubt your faith. Let's go. All right. We're back here in Shots Fired. Oh, man, that was... That was awesome. That was really awesome. I, I got to call. He's coming back. He's coming back to the show. But anyway, let's keep the show going. Right now, we're going to tone it down just a little bit. We got the NBA 2K segment, and we got a little bit of an alter thing with it because one of the players is better than usual. So right here, let's go to NBA 2K on Shots 5. I feel like I'm a giant when I'm 5'8". I feel multiplying when y'all hate. Yeah, I only
All right, here we go. So now, NBA 2K, you already know what we talk about. We try to find out some of the best gamers out there and see what they do and see if they can make the game even better. And now what we have here is a little bit of a theory. What if Shaquille O'Neal could shoot? Like, really? Let's think about this. Shaquille O'Neal is one of the most dominant big men to ever come to the NBA. I mean, during the 90s, this guy was insanely good. But you know he was a terrible shooter. I mean, I was looking up some stats about him, and this guy was literally one of the worst shooters to ever, 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 ever get in the game. I mean, granted, dominant player when it comes to being down low. I mean, this guy played the most games when he was back in 1993 on the Magic, you know, averaging almost 40 you know, minutes a game, points up to 30, 25, go, go, go. But when it came to three points, He's never shot one except one game in 1995-1996 on the Magic. And he was 50%. So that was actually pretty good. Like, I don't know how he did that. But never shot another three ever. His mid-range is different because he doesn't really need it. He's just a big one that backs down his opponents down low. But if Shaquille O'Neal had that power, how more dominant could he have been? I mean, one thing, the leader right now when it comes to centers, shooting threes is Al Horford. I mean, this guy's the, one of the best shooting centers of all time. But one of the number one shooters of all time was Dirk Nowitzki. I mean, this guy was seven foot, 245. I mean, he's made over nearly 1,200 three-point shots in his career. He's about 38% from three. And again, being seven foot is insane. The Bleacher Report even said his combined size and skill and long range effectiveness has become one of the greatest players to ever be in NBA history. And he's ranked 39th of all time in the regular season in three point field goals and made 24th of all time in his career. Dirk was that dude. He also won NBA All-Star Weekend three point shootout in 2006 and was the only power forward in the center to do so. Oh man, I forgot to ask Gary what it was like to do in the shootout contest in NBA All-Star. I knew I forgot something. Ah, I want to get him back. I want to get him back. I want to get him back. But, no, but we definitely talk about Soul Survivor. But, now here's the thing. Shaq made one three-point shot in his career. Yup, best fantasy skill I've ever had. What's up? Heat champions, there's no doubt, brother. Oh, what's going on? Forgot my YouTube people. I'm so sorry I was ignoring y'all. Real quick, we we'll get to right there. Astro, how you doing? Jose Flores, the Heat champions, there's no doubt, brother. And then masking, best fan you still have ever had. Word, that's what you did. <laughs> but anyway, my man Elite, Scotty Elite, is Shaq only made one. And that's only one. And I always wonder if he can do so much more in the NBA if he can shoot. But I said, the big man's, the, the true big man is gone. Kevin Durant, to me, was the one that changed it. I don't think Dirk did. Dirk was just a freak of nature, all right? But Kevin Durant, now, this guy came and I was like, no, I'm not going down. I'm staying behind the three. I'm going to be a three-tier player. Not only can I can go to the rack, but I'm going to handle the rack and I'm going to be a point guard. Shaq can never do that. I remember he used to play NBA 2K and you take up Shaq and all of a sudden he would dribble and then all of a sudden lose the ball and fall. and then <laughs> Like that was the old school for big men. And that was insane to me. I was like, dude, you really can't dribble the ball? Like you're literally an NBA all-star. You should be able to at least dribble the ball. But... The thing about that is that I always love watching big men also take it to the next level, but then we take away from the point guard. True point guards are very hard to come by. I mean, Kyle Lowry, I mean, we can talk right now in Miami Heat, he's what you call a true point guard. Jimmy Butler is a beast, but he's a shooting guard small forward. That's a fact. So now big men, they can do everything what point guards can do. The game is just getting taller and it's getting faster and you gotta be stronger. All that's gonna happen sooner or later are mismatches period. Unless you're quick like CP3 and have a crazy first step before Derrick Rose hurt his knees, you're going to be out of the game. You're going to have to go overseas to actually have like a height limitation, which I think we're getting there because these kids are huge. Have you seen it? They're seven foot five at 12. Bruh, what are you eating? I'm I mean, we ate like terrible high fructose corn syrup every day and an hour later and all stuff, but we didn't grow that tall. But Shaq was a definitely different monster when it comes to this. But like I said, the whole thing was that if he could shoot, this man not only would have been the greatest of all time, he would have been the epitome of a freak of nature. Giannis, Dirk, Kevin, all y'all could never de Shaquille O'Neal because of his size and body. And if he had a handle and a three-point shot, who's stopping that? No one. 
But yeah, anyway, we're still rocking out. I appreciate you guys sticking here. Shots fired, episode 16. Again, Gary Ford is so dope. Please buy his book. Please buy his book. I know I bought mine. All right, we're going to go to the next one. This is two of my favorite segments of Shots Fired because it's all about history. And this is the FIBA story. And this one is actually quite interesting because it hits home for me. FIBA story and Shots Fired. Let's check it out. Now, we've talked about different countries. All right, we've been to Germany. You know, we've been to Turkey. We've been to, uh, you know, different parts of, of the islands. But it's time to go to where I'm from. My family. My grandfather. Asia! All right, let's bring this up right here. FIBA Asia. Now, FIBA is the incredible organization. World dominated that enables basketball to grow a little more every day throughout the world. You know why? Because FIBA is everywhere. It's in every country. It's in every back alley. It's if you think, think there's a court, someone creates one. And that's the beauty about FIBA. It basically took 200 clubs back in the day, brought them together and say, hey, the NBA is cool, but let's go around the world. That's why we have World Cups and it's insane. But then also we have it in Asia. Now, Let's talk about these Asian countries that we have because Asia is like broken up in different parts, okay? Now, we got dudes that can ball, but then we got people who are just born to play the game. I mean, that's what I love about FIBA is that we can go to different countries and see amazing talent, like Giannis. Now, in East Asia, we got China. Again, one of the powerhouses. 60, 625 million people love basketball. Then Japan, that's insane. I love my anime. Southeast Asia, you got to get up to Indonesia. They can produce, but then the Philippines, one of the number one smallest multi-island countries that love basketball, West Asia, which you got Iran, and then also you got to give it up to Lebanon, okay? And then we got to go to Sri Lanka, that's also in South Asia, that was Pakistan and Sri Lanka, and then also Iran is in West Asia, and then you got Lebanon here. My bad, screwed up my, my country from this region. And then we gotta go to the Gulf and we have Saudi Arabia. And then who else do we have? The one and only Qatar, which is, oh, I can't wait to go to Qatar. And then Central Asia, we got Kazakhstan. And then you got Uzbekistan, all right? So that's a total of a lot right there. And it's about 1245 members who have been added to over the years. In fact, I'm going, I can't list all the countries or I literally will still be here till tomorrow and I got stuff to do. I got to go to North Carolina. I got I to work. But anyway, look, the first Asian basketball championship was held in Manila, Philippines. You know, back when? I'm going to tell you right now, in 1960. Since then, basketball has gone from strength to strength across the continent. And just look at the size of the basketball community in other countries like the Philippines. I mean, like I said, the Philippines love basketball so much. They really give homage. And if you don't remember, when Kobe passed away, Black Mama, Kobe Bryant, the, all the tributes that were paid there was insane. It was magnificent. All right, you could really feel the passion and the pure love of the community when it came to ball. Incidentally, I would like to remind you that this summer, the FIBA 2023 World Cup will be held in the Philippines, Japan, and in Indonesia. All right, these three Asian countries are going to be the cornerstone to one of the best World Cups you've ever seen. And you don't want to miss it. The atmosphere promises to be crazy. Even though FIBA has played a major role in development of basketball in Asia, the arrival of former NBA stars has also helped its profile. I mean, you gotta think about everyone that's kind of coming over from the NBA wants to travel overseas and they make a lot more money and get a lot more prestige. And of course, everyone over there comes to the NBA because that's what you want to be. I mean, we already know some typical local stars when it came to Asia. You know, one of the biggest men ever. Let's give it up to the one and only Boom Yao Ming. And then also we had, I don't know, Lin Sanity who killed it, Jeremy Lin. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank one Dwight Howard, who is currently playing in Taiwan and can't pay in to bring the playoff losers. <sighs> like LeBron. Maybe. I don't know if LeBron went over, it would literally break the internet. But, I mean, who am I to say? I mean, he can cry in a different language, I guess. But shout out to all those countries right there. I mean, I love Asia and just to see it grow and grow when it comes to China, Japan, Indonesia, Philippines, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Iran, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, Qatar, Pakistan, and Pakistan, it's just muta bene. Like it's beautiful. Jiao yo, jiao yo. I know a little Chinese. But anyway, 
And of course, the transition is we have this next segment on Shots Fired, which is the Worldwide Court. And I'm pretty sure you can guess who we're going to be talking about. So anyway, let's check out Worldwide Court, Shots Fired. Let's go. All right, Worldwide Court. All I got to say is, you know my last name is Chang, and we're going back to my motherland, Zhongguo, also known as China. Bring it up right here. The next country has approximately 625 million basketball fans. That's right, 625 million basketball fans, okay? That's nearly 90% of the population. And that's more than everyone in the United States, which is insane. And it really is a powerhouse of a country for this spot because that country is China. And basketball in China goes way back. Back in the time. I mean, like, way back. Like, back introduced in the late 1900s. Like, literally, 1890s. It was just crazy. What? And basketball was invented in Springfield Co- and Springfield Co- instructor, you know, James Day Smith in 1891, which is insane. But yeah, you heard that correctly. And support has gained quickly. In 1935, basketball was introduced as a national pastime. And in just one year, an Olympic basketball team was formed due to the popularity of the sport. Remember early when I said that China had around 625 million basketball fans? Well, 143 million of those were considered hard core fans, meaning they regularly watch and play the sport every day. With the other 482 million, they were general fans due to the popularity of basketball and also that China had to give for the long-standing partnership with the NBA. As you see, James Harden just signed the sneaker and you tell him they're gonna fight for that sneaker right there. And also it just kept raising, 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 raising awareness. And if you thought we loved it, the NBA loves it more. Because what happens? The Washington Bullets, now the Wizards, was the first team to be invited to China back in 1970. Nine, which is insane since a host of an expedition that was taking part in the country and the popularity of the NBA significantly went up in 2002, which is what? Just think about 1.3 billion and 1.3 billion Jordan's been Jordan right now is taken right now. But as the Chinese center Yao Ming was selected the first overall pick in a draft, bam, he was the first international player to be selected ever, ever. Ming had a nine year NBA career and which we saw him as an eight-time All-Star, which was insane, and saw his jersey retired by the Houston Rockets. Nowadays in social media and day and age, stuff like that, the NBA holds over 44 million followers on Weibo, and the application on China is similar to Twitter. I mean, making an organization more accessible to Chinese citizens, many the players have gone to China to play in the country national league too. Chinese Basketball Association is included Tracy McGrady, all right, one of my favorite players, Gilbert Arenas, number zero, age zero, Meta World Peace, you know his real name, also Jeremy Lin, and many more. I mean, Chinese people love basketball in the NBA. I mean, that's all they play today. And it's a major player in the NBA's international expansion. In fact, probably the biggest player ever. So I got one word to say to you, what's well, two? Jiao China, Jiao, which basically means like come on. And if you ever go to a game in China, just go Jiao. It's gonna be like Jiao, 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 Jiao. Woo! This is a dope one. I like this one. This is a dope episode. I love my Scott. Yo, Elite, I see you there. You're always so loyal to the game. Thanks for coming through. We got some more people coming through on YouTube. We got some people here on TikTok. All right, we got almost a thousand likes, which I like. I like. But then also, ah, Twitch. We're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. We're gonna get there. We got some stuff to work out. Shout out to Gary Forbes. He was the highlight of the show. I can't wait to cut that up and make that beautiful. Definitely check out Soul Survivors when you can. Buy the merch. Buy the series. Get to somebody. It's it's incredible how creative this man is and what he did with Type One Diabetes and doing the NBA. Right now, the NBA Finals are hot. We're gonna be rocking out. I may have some news for everybody next week. It's a big one. And I'm pretty sure we're going to highlight shots fire. Shout out to FIBA powering this. Get the Jelly Smack with our amazing scripts and stuff like that. Thomas, Blend, Bleon, appreciate y'all. And also the one and only Sasha, a.k.a. Buckets Buenos. I love you. I know he's in my ear. And I know he just be watching me like, oh, my God, I hear him talk all the time. But he's awesome what he does. And he makes this show so beautiful. Magnifique, submissive, beaucoup. But, yo, we will be back. All right, just make sure I get the dates because we have another guest next week. And I don't want to misspeak. 
<laughs> yeah, we'll be back on June 8th. That is going to be next Thursday, actually. So I got to make sure I get that right. Yeah, we must be like on June 8th for next Thursday because I got some stuff to do. Yep, June 8th, next Thursday. Um, and then after that, we have a really special guest. She's coming away from Egypt on the 16th. Um, the 21st week, we may be off. I'm going to let you know. I'll talk to you about that, Sasha, later. But yeah, this is a good one. Let me see right now. Let's see that they have basketball, great culture. Uh, and I like when China hosts the 3x3 World Tour almost a year in different areas. Yep. These guys leagues know he's 3x3, and the World Cup is insane right now. I got to keep watching it. USA did their thing. Egypt is one-on-one. Sarai Muhammad, I see you, boo-boo. And uh, Lithuania, oh, my God. But Austria, definitely strong. Carlton, I see you. But anyway, this has been Shots Fired. Y'all been awesome. I need to take a shower. And I'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much for tuning in. I've been your man, Vince Chang.